evening, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, whoever is out there. Um, welcome to Thinking About. Um, my name is Deborah Young, and I am the head of modern languages at the Elm Green School. Um, languages has been uh, a huge part of my life since the age of about seven, when I would wake up early on a Sunday morning, and instead of watching the programmes um, about uh, God, I would watch the language programmes on BBC. So by the age of 11, I had effectively taught myself French and carried on learning languages uh, from then on. Um, they say that opposites attract. Uh, however, I think that uh, language learners tend to seek out their own kind. And uh, in that respect, I did seek out uh, a language learning enthusiast um, to be my husband, and I'd like to introduce him tonight. Um, uh, can I introduce Dr. Clive Young, who is an enthusiastic language learner and all around clever clogs and, uh, and my husband. So, um, Clive, uh, welcome. Hello, Deb. Uh, Deb, Deb's, in, Deb's in, the next, she's in the next room, actually, so uh, we, don't, we don't speak to each other at home. Um, so um, thanks very much. Clever clogs. I'm not sure I could quite live up to that, but uh, I must say it's a real honour to be speaking to, 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 to everyone tonight about the, um, the intrigue of language. Uh, I'm going to share some slides. I'm going to talk probably about uh, 20, 25 minutes and kind of really go through kind of my journey uh, around languages and, and why I'm finding interesting. But at the end, I'll give a few tips if you're interested in learning languages yourself and some ideas uh, around that. So I'm going to sort of, um, I'm going to say, share my screen and uh, hopefully that's going to come up. And hopefully you guys can see that. Everyone see that okay? I bet you probably can. Um, so I... Uh, I've kind of renamed uh, the presentation uh, the uh, accidental polyglot because it's to, to remind folk that um, I'm not a kind of professional languages person at all. I'm just a kind of a, I would say, kind of fairly ordinary punter. Um, I uh, um, didn't study uh, languages at university, did a degree in languages, uh, I studied uh, biology. And my uh, PhD is actually in uh, is actually in seaweed, so it's not languages. So languages for me has been a kind of a, a social thing, something I've, I've done uh, really mostly uh, in my own time. I do a lot, do a little bit of work uh, in languages now, but uh, but it's a smallish uh, smallish part. So um, why uh, so so why um, when I was preparing this, I thought, well, maybe I'll do a little list of the kind of languages I've studied over the years. And, and there it is there. That's a bit of a shock to me, actually. And I'm not really saying this to kind of show up in any way. Um, really just to say that, uh, you know, I've got kind of a, a kind of a wide, wide interest. And I wouldn't claim to be particularly fluent in, in all those whatever number of languages they are. Uh, some I could probably hold a reasonable conversation in. Uh, others have maybe learned or uh, I knew enough to pass an exam, but have since then kind of forgotten. Some I can't remember anything at all. Like Arabic and Punjabi were there. I couldn't remember a single word. I don't really think. But at some point, I have um, uh, studied uh, all, those, uh, all those languages. Um, but the name for that, a person who does all that sort of stuff, is a, as I say, is a, is a polyglot. And um, you, you can probably think of other words for that sort of enthusiasm. But... Um, but there's quite a lot of people out there. If you go into, if you go online, if you go to YouTube, you'll find lots of people who claim to be uh, polyglots to speak uh, 12 languages or 20 languages or, or whatever. The average on this list seems to be around about eight. Um, and these are people who kind of learned languages uh, off their own bat, if you like. Uh, but if you come from different parts of the world, if you're from, or your family are from Africa or Asia, you'll find that uh, many communities are, are naturally uh, polyglots, you know, they, they'll speak a number of languages at, at home, or maybe at different parts of their lives, you know, different languages with the market and go to school and so on. So it's a fairly, polyglotism is not a, uh, it's fairly common uh, across the world. It's a bit unusual in the, in the UK. So the question is, Clive, why are you so interested in languages? And I blame my parents. So my mum was English, my dad was from uh, she was from Manchester, my dad from, from Glasgow, uh, but she had the, um, they were kind enough to make sure I was born and brought up in Scotland. Uh, I was born in Edinburgh, way up the road there, and uh, I went to school in a number of uh, uh, areas in the kind of east coast of Scotland. Uh, the little red stars there on the map represent places I went to primary school, the yellow one where I went to uh, secondary school. And uh, in that, uh, at that time in those areas, uh, people spoke um, Scots, so quite a lot of Scots. Now, Scots has had various names in the past, sometimes called it a dialect and sometimes a language and sometimes bad English and sometimes slang. It has a variety of ways of de describing it. But certainly when I was young, you really had to learn it. Uh, if you're a little child, a little bairn, as we'd say, uh, in, the, in the playground or the, or, or the street, you really had to learn it. There's a fair, fair risk. If you didn't learn Scots, 
you could well be beaten up by your pals. Uh, but when you went into the classroom at school, you weren't allowed to use Scots at all. You had to speak, uh, you know, proper English, Scottish English is what I'm speaking with you uh, now. Um, and uh, if you didn't, if you use Scots in the classroom, you were sometimes considered a bit cheeky and um, you could be uh, uh, punished for it. Um, so when, uh, if you're not so familiar with Scots, um, it's got lots and lots of words, lots of words that we use, I'm still using Scotland, which are quite uh, different from English. And there's hundreds and hundreds and thousands, in fact, of them. Uh, and all these words in this kind of list here, we, we would kind of use uh, fairly regularly. Um, there wasn't much when I was at school. It was fairly informal. You learned stuff as you, as you went along. There was a kind of co couple of comics you could read in Scots, but basically that was about it. A little bit of poetry, Robert Burns and that wrote in Scots. Uh, but one of my teachers, and this is this is not one of my teachers, sort of how teachers looked when I was at school, uh, they should lady here, uh, she said to us, oh, you bairns are bilingual, you children are bilingual, you speak two languages. She was very impressed by the way we went from uh, the, the playground into the classroom and, and moved our language around in that way, swapped around. And that, folks, is what really kind of triggered something in our mind. I quite like the idea uh, of, of being bilingual. So back in the day, though, she was a little bit unusual. Um, you could still be punished, as I said, for speaking Scots, uh, out of turn. And there's a reason for that, that people thought that if you had two languages in your head, you were half as bright. Um, there was quite a, um, um, and this this kind of thought was, it kind of carried on really into any of the days I was at school, um, that, you know, if you had two languages in your head, that would confuse you, and therefore you wouldn't do very well at school. That was the sort of thing. And the punishment for speaking Scots was quite severe. Um, people would hit children with a, a kind of leather strap. This is called a toss, that's a Scottish name for it, um, which was designed specially to it sounds bizarre, it sounds a terrible thing to say, but that was designed for uh, hitting small children. And um, I was never, um, I never got hit for speaking Scots in the classroom because um, I'd say my mom was English and I could swap around pretty quickly. But some of the, some of the kids weren't so good at that and they certainly did get uh, punished for it. For it. Uh, it was a terrible thing, but um, fortunately, nowadays, things have moved on in Scotland and uh, Scots is recognised as a proper language and it is actually taught a little bit in schools. And the, the comics that we learned at kids, as kids, uh, there's Ur Willie, that's where the character's there. Uh, he now helps children to, to, to learn Scots. There's a translation of Harry Potter has now been translated into Scots, as has been many, many books of Gruffalo and things like that. And there was um, a survey fairly recently to show that around about 30% of Scottish people, particularly in the lowland areas, uh, speak uh, at least some Scots. And some of those words that we, we talked about uh, before. So uh, I kind of, I've been interested in that. I mean, I, I actually do kind of a bit of work in Scots. I've done, done a couple of kind of, uh, created a couple of uh, kind of books and booklets around that area. And I'm currently working on a, uh, another book about Scots, about the social aspects of Scots. Uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a kind of offshoot of language called social linguistics, which is how Scots is used. You know, why would kids then use uh, one language in one place and uh, another language in another place? Uh, that's the kind of um, area of social linguistics. I'm writing a couple of kind of books in that, uh, in, in that area, all about the history of the language. And the sort of question we're asking is like, are Scots speakers really bilingual? Not all Scots speakers would regard themselves as such. So there's, there's lots of kind of interesting questions uh, around language come from uh, from that. However, I quite like to call myself a bilingual in that sense because uh, it's tended to be kind of a good thing. And this was taken from a website, but there's, there's actually been a lot of research of late to say that if you speak more than one language, you don't have to like fully bilingual, it's just like speaking another language reasonably, reasonably commonly, um, or even another dialect, it doesn't have to be a full language. Um, it increases your brain power, makes you more intelligent. Um, it gives kids, and this has been shown that kids who speak more than one language have a slight advantage uh, academically. And for old people like myself, it can keep your kind of your brain ticking over uh, much longer. Uh, it makes it easy to learn other languages, uh, travel, and getting jobs and improving your social life. You probably that goes with languages as well. Increase the awareness of other cultures. You can better raise your kids bilingual. I've got a couple of kids who are. Uh, bilingual, uh, but this is the most important one. It can make you more attractive. That's, of course, is why we would learn uh, languages uh, 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 anyway, make you more attractive. So, um, so, but going back, I was kind of getting ahead of, ahead of myself a little bit. So when I went back, so whether it's primary school, Scots and English, uh, but when I went to secondary school, I went to Hogwarts. Well, I didn't, but I went to a Scottish school, which looks and still looks a little bit like that, one's old style uh, Scottish school. So we didn't learn Scots, obviously, uh, that wouldn't do. We learned uh, French and Latin. So Latin was, uh, very, they were very keen in those sort of schools in those days uh, to learn Latin. And if you've ever come across Latin, um, it is, um, it's not a modern foreign, uh, more foreign language, it's a classical language. Um, 
even a simple word like, uh, it's a very structural language, so it's like a simple word like uh, mensa, which means table, has all these different forms you have to learn, depending how you use it in a sentence. So the way they used to teach us, as you saw a picture there, um, we would all sit in kind of rows like that, and the teacher would say, right, young, that's what they used to call everyone by their surnames, uh, young, you start up and tell me, uh, give me all that, uh, the, the um, uh, describe all the different forms of mensa. And you'd have to stand there. And uh, if you got it right, you could sit down. If you didn't get it right, you had to keep on standing up. And occasionally the teacher would throw bits of chalk at you to try and jog your memory. It was quite a severe way of learning. But actually, folks, um, I, I still remember quite a lot of that stuff. So it maybe had some kind of uh, uh, some kind of benefits. Um, but Latin, Latin isn't taught so much now, really. Um, the um, the reason for it, it was it was taught at all was uh, partly because it's a sort of un underpins a lot of the kind of Latin or Romance languages, uh, particularly in Europe and also English as well. English has got quite a lot of um, uh, Latin based or French based uh, language in it uh, in as well. So uh, Latin kind of kind of provides this kind of a, uh, allegedly anyway, this uh, entry point into some of these other languages we'll come to in a minute. But for me, actually, I thought Latin was good because it, it makes other languages look easy. Uh, all those tables and things are quite hard to learn. So when you come to another language like Italian or something, it just seems a lot more to, more more uh, more straightforward. So, uh, but that's not the reason why I became an accidental polyglot. Um, I became an accidental polyglot because I didn't go to South America. Um, we were planning myself and some, uh, some friends at university to go a trip around South America, but we never quite got there. They weren't very well organized, but my job really in that group was to learn Spanish, you know, because I was obviously interested in languages. I didn't know any Spanish at the time. So off I went to learn Spanish. And um, I had a Spanish teacher, we were up in Aberdeen in Scotland at the time. And uh, I got a Spanish teacher, a young woman from Barcelona. And, you know, things happened, you know, languages make you attractive. Um, I, uh, we kind of became a romance and kind of went to get, uh, became a, um, uh, a pair and um, got married and had kids and all that sort of thing, got divorced, all that sort of thing. Um, but when we went to, uh, we were first together, we would speak, uh, she was wanting to learn English um, and I was always interested in learning Spanish. So we'd speak uh, Spanish one day and English uh, another. And we tried to keep to that pretty pretty strictly. So even when we were having a fight and you know couples fight sometimes, we tried to keep in character. So uh, even when it was arguing or trying to keep arguing in Spanish, which is a really, a really good way of learning, by the way, um, try not to slip into uh, slip into English. So, uh, so that was one thing, but we went over to uh, Barcelona a lot to see our family. And uh, as you can imagine, Spanish families, they have this kind of big meals and drink and wine and all that sort of thing. And uh, when I first went over, I noticed that after a certain time in the night, I couldn't understand what the people were saying, right? And I was pretty, I was pretty stupid at the time. You know, still, I'm pretty stupid at the time uh, now. And uh, I, I didn't know why there was. I thought it was me the drink. Maybe I was, maybe I'd had too much to wine. I couldn't understand what they were saying, or maybe they'd had too much wine. They couldn't understand what they were saying. But of course, clever people in this audience will realize what actually happened is that they all switched into a different language. So in uh, Catalonia and Barcelona, uh, they speak Catalan. And Catalan is sort of similar to uh, Spanish, but it, it kind of isn't. Um, <clears throat> and they're quite proud of it. Uh, Catalonia is not Spain. You see, it's got banners up. Um, and if you look at uh, look at uh, um, uh, Catalan and and and, uh, and Spanish, they they uh, call it Espanol or Castellano. They prefer to call that Castellano. They use that. And if you look at the words, um, they're, they're kind of similar but different. So you've got like some of the words there on the screen there: bank, banco, plaza, playa, carré, calle, sortida, salida, bebida, bebida. So these they're sort of similar but different, you know. Uh, and you probably notice actually when I speak foreign languages, any foreign languages, I speak them with a Scottish accent. So um, uh, I'll come back to the uh, a problem with that uh, later on. Uh, but basically, um, I uh, I kind of learned uh, I learned Catalan. Digi Digi was a book I learned, uh, and they're, they're they're quite as I say they're quite proud of it. That, that that phrase in the middle says "Deixa el español y parla catalán a What that means is drop speaking Spanish and speak speak Catalan with everybody. You know, so and that's what I tried to do. But it's kind of interesting Catalan. It's not a language that people tend to learn. So. Uh, from people outside the family or friends, I would speak Catalan people, they kind of look at me very strangely. And it was like as if a, a dog had started speaking to them. You know, why would anybody want to do that? And then that was the first reaction. That still happens if I, if I go to Barcelona, people are speaking Catalan, they go, very strange. Um, and, but then they go immediately into sort of very fast colloquial Catalan. Uh, there's no slowing down, there's no quarter given. You have to kind of uh, uh, speak it. So, um, so I learned Catalan. So that was kind of cool by that. So that's by that stage, I could say I was a polyglot. I had kind of English and Scots, obviously, and then um, uh, Spanish and Catalan. But hey, folks, what could we do next with that? So uh, remember the Latin bit, as I was saying before? 
Um, it's a lot of languages quite similar to um, um, Spanish. Uh, Portuguese, you probably know that. Um, Catalan, Italian, French, and Romanian all have this uh, big overlap in terms of the calculus. So I thought, hey, well, if I could sort of speak two languages, why don't I have a go with some more? So um, as well as Catalan, I learned uh, Italian. I did uh, an A-level Italian, I did some Portuguese. And I'd already done a bit of French at school, as I mentioned, and I kind of fired that up a little bit as well. And if you look at the kind of um, language across, look at the vocabulary across these languages, um, you've got, um, let's say, to, to drink, the bear, French, boire, uh, Italian, berry, uh, to learn, Aprender in Spanish, apprendre in French, imparare in Italian, uh, to study, estudiar, étudier, estudiar. So you can you kind of get the idea that it's, it's actually not difficult. Once you kind of kind of get a uh, hang of one language, these other ones become quite easily. The only the only one I haven't really had much success with is is Romanian. That's a little bit it's a little bit like in Latin actually. It's a, a little bit more of a complicated grammatical. Uh, language. So, uh, so that was a kind of an easy route to, to that. So you might think, well, okay then, Clive, that's all very well. What's the use of all that? Well, it kind of makes life really kind of interesting. So um, we went, um, I went to live in Mallorca for a while. You know, Mallorca, the kind of island in the uh, in the Mediterranean, people go on their holidays. It's very nice, nice place to visit. Uh, but if you're a kind of a linguist, uh, this is it's really quite a fascinating place. Uh, I, I would describe it as a kind of linguistic uh, layer cake. Uh, and the people in there speak different languages. And if you just go in, if you're just on your holidays, you probably don't notice that. But uh, but there's certainly a lot of lang different languages spoken. So the local language is a language called Mallorquí. And Mallorquí is a variant of Catalan. It has it's a little bit of difficulty in the difference in the grammar and the pronunciation and so on, but it's essentially uh, Catalan. And then uh, you, quite a lot of Catalan spoken there as well, or Catalan, as they call it. Um, and that is from people who come over from you know, main mainland Catalonia or Valencia, they come over and speak Catalan. A lot of people speak um, uh, what we call Spanish, Castellano or Castellano, they call it, Espanol. Um, these are people who come over to work at basically Mallorca in the tourist industry or my building and that sort of thing. A lot of people there. And then on top of that, there's international languages. There's uh, English and German. French used to be very popular in Mallorca, but uh, German has really taken over as well. So whenever you're going through that, people speak different languages. And I know it's quite interesting is if you speak to kind of local people in, in Mallorca, um, and I say we kind of kind of live there for, for a while. Um, they will speak in one of those languages and, and they seem to sort of have a switch in their mind. So some people I would speak in Catalan to, others I would speak to in Castilian to, and others they would speak to me in English. And they could never quite work out, well, I couldn't remember which was which, but they all knew which language they should speak to me in. And um, and um, it's quite it's quite a kind of a, a you know, a kind of rich match. The, the kids, uh, my kids there were, uh, they went to school in um, there as well, and they went Catalan and Mallorca uh, as well as others. So they are proper um, proper bilingual, triangle, trilingual kids. An interesting kind of side of all of that is that um, in New York, as I mentioned, they speak a lot of German. A lot of German to a school over there. And I'm quite fond of, uh, quite fond of German stuff. Um, the, uh, I uh, worked in uh, uh, Germany a little bit when I left, uh, left school. I went to work uh, in south and southern Germany. So I spoke a little bit of German, but not very well. And I kind of renewed my love for German stuff. Uh, when I was in New York, it sounds a bit strange and to go to Spain and learn German, but the, they have a lot of kind of like German food and that sort of thing. There's um, uh, currywurst, it's one of my favourite uh, German foods. Um, they've got German radio, German newspapers, all that sort of stuff. So I kind of kind of fired up uh, again my, uh, uh, my, my interest uh, in German. And um, German is kind of an interesting language as well for me, because uh, when, as I said earlier, when I speak, uh, um, I speak Spanish, or French or Italian, I speak with a Scottish accent. So people kind of know I'm a foreigner and they treat me appropriately in that, you know, so, they, uh, so, so that's okay. We all know where we are. Within, with German though, it's slightly different because I speak German with a Scottish accent. My a Scottish accent is a Germanic accent, right? So I speak German with a Germanic accent, which means I kind of sound kind of German. And of course, people have argued that I kind of look kind of German as well. I certainly look more German than I do Spanish, let's say. Um, and the, the problem with that is my German's still not very good. It's uh, pretty, pretty poor, actually. So uh, I have real problems with speaking with Germans because they, they, uh, I kind of speak fairly authentically and I can uh, look kind of German, yet my German's not very good. And therefore, they think I'm very rude or very stupid. And it took me a while to work out that. Why was I not really getting on with my German? It's because of that. So I've got a kind of a goal in life, really, uh, is to try and eventually be able to speak German in a way that Germans don't think I'm rude or stupid. 
just a sort of small point on that is uh, remember we said that if you learn one uh, Latin language, like to learn Spanish or Italian, you've got the other ones that are available to you. It's the same true in the German as well, by the way. Um, you can, if you learn German, you can Dutch, then it's a sort of like a very simplified, I'm speaking very broadly here. Um, Dutch is like a simplified form of German and Afrikaans is a simplified form of Dutch. So if you have one language, you can sort of think about others. Uh, and Scandinavian languages also are very closely related to German as well, Swedish. Uh, and of course, if you learn Swedish, you can learn some of the other Scandinavian languages which are very similar. Danish and Norwegian are very similar again. So uh, I've kind of time dabbled around uh, those areas as well, but not gone as far as I have with the uh, Romance uh, languages. So uh, going back to work, uh, I've been very lucky, uh, until, at least until the pan pandemic hit us, I've traveled a lot through Europe uh, doing uh, various workshops in my kind of career, I, I do learning, I, I work at one of the universities, uh, UC, UCL in London, and I help people to design courses and stuff like that. And it's quite nice to see uh, all your work kind of translated into other languages. There's uh, some of my stuff done in Japanese and Welsh, and I think that's Danish. Um, I do most of uh, my workshops in, in English, though, and I um, um, have done some, some in Spanish and I've attended, uh, uh, participated in workshops in in, in French and Catalan as well, but, um, but mostly in English. And the big question then is, you say, well, Clive, this is all very well, right? You're in Swiss languages. What does everyone speak English? Yeah, why, why would you learn languages anyway? Why do, why, why do you do that? So, and certainly when I go to universities and I work there, everyone speaks English. So everyone's learning English, okay? So why learn other languages? Well, actually, when you get down to it and you go into these countries and you travel around and you realize that people's English, uh, skills in English are very varied. Um, so if you're in, in the Netherlands or Scandinavia, it's very, very good indeed. And uh, uh, they will speak to, almost everyone will speak to you in English. But other places, including Germany, by the way, uh, language is not so good. If you go, move away from the kind of tourist areas and the main sort of centres, um, just get in a bus or a taxi or, you know, get a train somewhere and you'll find people who are actually very comfortable speaking English. And that's true in France and true, true in uh, Spain, Italy and so on. So it's really worth learning the languages. You'll be able to get around uh, much, much better in those. Um, so the question then is, if you if you're, um, don't speak English, English is the obvious language to learn. And that's why everyone wants to learn it. If you do speak English, as we all do, uh, what language do you learn then? So um, there's a couple of things uh, to, to think about there. Is One is uh, at school. Uh, if you, somebody's offering to teach a language, learn it. Take every advantage you can in the school language. There's some excellent teachers there who will help you to learn those languages. I know that Nell Green is a very good Spanish teacher there called Deborah Young. And uh, the, um, uh, if you've got that kind of opportunity to learn it, please do take it, it's really good. If you're from a, um, um, a family uh, where there's a community language, you know, kind of Polish or Portuguese or some of the languages like that, again, that's a good motivation to go a little bit deeper into that. I know many people who uh, can speak community language, maybe can write it and so on, there's an opportunity there. Or maybe further back, maybe your family come from, you know, um, you know, Greece or, 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 or somewhere else, and, and you can go back and uh, pick up those languages. It has a kind of connection. It gives you quite, quite motivating there. Most people learn it for a holiday, though, uh, and um, you can, uh, again, it's quite good if you learn a language of a target. I'm going to go to, I'm going to go to Portugal, and therefore I'm going to learn uh, Portuguese. You know, that, that's a really kind of a good motivation. Um, social language, um, if you have friends who speak uh, different languages, that's also a good way into it. Or you may have an interest, you may be interested in Italian football or something. It's quite good to pick up the language that way. And of course, work. Um, as I say, I use language a, a little bit with my, my work. And many jobs um, uh, really kind of uh, demand uh, language. So there's kind of, when you think about what languages I'm learning, just think about some of those different ways of motivating yourself to go through it. Um, I'm going to jump over that one because that's a bit thing. So what does it mean to speak a language? And I kind of dodge, I kind of often dodge that question. I kind of know languages, study languages, what does it mean to speak languages? Um, there's different ways of, there's, there's ways of kind of categorizing that. Uh, and this is, this is one way of it, there's other ways. Uh, this is called the framework reference for languages. And what this, this is based on the kind of a number, number of hours you spend in the language, but more importantly, um, how, uh, what you can do with the language. It's a kind of functional uh, uh, way of looking at it. So if you've got like A1 and A2, that means you can kind of get around in the language. You know, you can find, you can ask where the toilets are, and you can order a, a pizza, and you can uh, uh, ask directions. And you know, if you're not well with the doctor, that type of thing. That's A1 and A2. And for many reasons, for many people, and for many functions, like if you're going to hold you, that's absolutely fine. That's that, that you speak the language. You can speak the language, and you can do that and, and fulfill those purposes. And that's round about GCSE. Actually, that's in, in UK terms. That's GCSE language. Um, if you want to sort of have discussions with your family, and you, you know, if you you've got kind of relatives, for example. 
uh, maybe Italian, uh, speak Italian, then you probably want to say a little bit more than where's the toilet. You, uh, you need a little bit more language. You can't strike B1 and B2. These are the sort of languages. You need to spend a bit more time in it, but you can have more kind of independent conversations on that and a wider range of subjects. What do I feel about this? What we do tomorrow? What do you think about that? That's B1 and B2. They're very useless. And that's something like the A level level uh, of language. Uh, C1 is if you go to university and study languages. Um, and that's a much more in depth. Uh, 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 knowledge of the language. C2 is if you want to be a spy, essentially. That's a very advanced form of uh, uh, language. I, I'm never going to get there. I can't even get to C1 in many of them. Uh, and and, and I'd say, but it's quite useful to think that you don't have to be fluent in a language. All you have to do is get to be able to do what you want to do in that particular language. And that's the way to, to look at it. That's the target to, to go for. Um, so I'm just going to sort of start with a couple of slides here. Uh, and this is the first one. This is something that my French teacher when I was at school shared with me and it's sort of stuck in my mind and I'm going to share it with you. It's when you start off learning a, a language, you have a great deal of enthusiasm. Uh, it's something new. You haven't done that before. You say, oh, that's the way French people say that. Isn't that interesting? Oh, Germans do that. Oh, that's interesting as well. It's a kind of a, um, that's quite exciting. But you soon get to the, 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 the and that's probably about A1 or A2 kind of levels. But then you get to so what's called the plateau, right? And the plateau was when you realize, not to sort of like use the language properly, you have to learn lots and lots of words, yeah? Um, there's, uh, to get to kind of B1, B2, that sort of thing, you need to learn about 3,000 words. Uh, uh, B2 is maybe 4,500 words and so on. It's quite a lot of stuff. Um, and Historically, that's been quite a difficult, that's a difficult, quite, uh, it's quite difficult to get through that. You can become a bit demotivated, you learn a lot of stuff, but you don't seem to get any further on with that. Um, the, his, uh, back in the, in the day, in fact, it's still now to some extent, one way to do that is do exams. You know, they sort of like take you along the plateau, learning more and more words and more and more structures as, as you go, go along. And another way is if you uh, can, is to go and, you know, live in the country. Uh, I, I went and I worked in Germany for a little while. And you get along that plateau quite quickly because you have to uh, very swiftly. Um, another way of uh, getting along the plateau actually is to learn a language which you're, you're familiar with or similar to one you're familiar with. So if you sort of speak, uh, as I said, if you speak Spanish, uh, going along the plateau in Italian is actually very straightforward. A lot of the words look very similar. So you can get along that quite quickly. So you can get to speak in Italian, if you speak Spanish, you can get to speak to Italian uh, quite uh, quite quickly. But but, but that is a, that is a kind of a real issue, uh, learning languages. And that's why a lot of people like myself, you, know, you sort of dabble with languages, get really excited with one. But to actually get to a level of proficiency needs quite a lot of uh, quite a lot of work but it's well worth it when you get to that point when oh man the, the idea that when you're actually speaking to someone in their, their own language and they, they sort of communicate with you and speak with you in a very very different way and that's really very pleasing however that's the difficult bit but here's the good news folks this is my last slide um the this is what i would call the golden age of language learning okay and i've been struggling with languages for most of my life and now it's never been easier if you go back to where i was um, remember uh, when I was learning Latin and French at school, um, we had these dreadful ways of learning the language, you know, sort of like learning by humiliation, um, having to stand up and repeat all your Latin um, tables, uh, pretty awful kind of books. Uh, that complete French course was actually a book we used when I was at school. It was really horribly boring. But now, if you go beyond that, nowadays, it's just so much, much better. So we've got the social media and internet. So uh, through, I'll go through some of these things. Um, the, um, certainly, it's more far easier to find a tutor uh, if, you're, if, if, you're, if you want to learn a language. Um, uh, beyond the school, for example, um, the, um, um, the um, uh, much easier to get in contact with people, some who specialise in sort of like GC, GCSE or A-level or conversation or whatever, holiday languages, that sort of thing. Um, you can actually uh, speak to people who you don't actually see face-to-face. -face. I did some Swedish with some guy who was uh, in Stockholm, and it was really good. I learned sweet Swedish quite well through that. Um, He's a pretty good teacher. Uh, if you go into YouTube, there is uh, endless material uh, of uh, all sorts of languages. Most of it's kind of beginner level, but if you want to learn um, I don't know, French or German, anything like that, just loads and loads of stuff. The, the quality is variable, but you can work that out uh, yourself. It's just all lots of free stuff out there. Um, if you're lucky to have uh, Netflix or one of the streaming services, you can go and watch original films and series, uh, Casa de Papel in Spanish or Di Poisson. Um, Call my agent, I think is the English name for that, a uh, French, uh, um, uh, French series. These are all really great. And even if your language is not that uh, uh, developed, you can uh, 
can watch the subtitles. Um, you could watch the subtitles in French, you could watch subtitles in Spanish. Uh, there's a kind of a, 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 um, an add-in you can do for your browser. You can watch subtitles in French and uh, in English. So these are really great. These are things were never available to me when I was learning languages first off. It was just great. And even if you don't pick up the language, you can get an idea of the way it sounds and the way people speak to each other and the expression, the tone, all that sort of stuff. Um, there is also um, uh, apps. Um, you may be familiar with these ones, Memorize and Duolingo. Memorize is a, uh, a way of learning vocabulary, essentially. It's getting along that plateau by learning what's vocabulary. Duolingo is a little bit more grammatical. It takes you through little phrases uh, that you translate, and there's one there. Uh, there are 15,000 cat photos on my cell phone, and you can translate that into what looks like Chinese there. Yeah. Um, so, um, and that that's really, a lot of people find that really, really appealing because it's got to turn language learning into a game. And you get scores and you get little things flash on the screen to say that you've reached this particular thing. And that, for many people, I, I don't use them a lot myself, but a lot of people find them very, very motivating. My favourite way, I'll just say, well, my favourite way is actually audio recordings. Um, I've used this, uh, there's a method there called the uh, Michael Thomas method, which is audio recordings. Um, and um, they take you through learning a language in a very staged way. You start with very simple sentences and you get to more and more complicated grammatical stuff. Uh, and I find it just a great way. You don't learn much vocabulary. You need Memorize or Duolingo or something to pick up the vocabulary. But it's a really nice way of getting your uh, ear around the language. Uh, and of course, when I started doing that back in the day, that was on cassettes. You remember cassettes. And now, of course, you download that stuff, stick it on your phone. You put your uh, earphones in. And you can listen to it on the bus. So if you don't mind funny looks, because if you're sitting there with your earphones in and you're mumbling away in, in, in Portuguese or Dutch or Arabic, people will give you kind of funny looks. But, uh, but it's a great way. So really, you can surround yourself uh, with languages. And uh, if you're interested at all in anything there that's kind of in, in, inspired you, there's lots of different ways to, to approach it. And everyone's different. You know, some things you'll really like and some things you really hate. You can find your own way depending on, how, you know, how you learn and what time you've got in your, uh, you know, in your day. Uh, one, what your target is, you know, whether you want to just learn about holiday language or you want to go a little bit deeper and, and so on and so on. There's lots of different ways. So um, really my advice is, uh, you know, just take this op opportunity. It's a fantastic time to learn languages. It's so fascinating. You learn to, you, learn to you, you find you're speaking to people in a completely different way. You get access to different types of parts of culture. You can make new friends. It's just great. So um, hopefully, hopefully if they, uh, that would inspire you a little bit uh, and have a look at some of these different ways of learning and pick you the best one that's best for yourself. How are we on time? I'm going to stop there. I think I've sort of talked enough um, and I'm just going to stop with my last slide there. Uh, this is my wife's idea, the polyglottal stop. I'm going to do a polyglottal stop there and uh, stop now. And uh, I'm very happy to take uh, uh, any questions. Uh, I'm not sure you could answer that many, but I'm happy to do so. I'm going to stop sharing and that's me back there. Um, thank you very much for that, Dr. Young. I found it very interesting. Um, we have a few questions in the Q&A section. And the first one is, do you think the Latin is worth learning as a stepping stone to, other, to learning other languages, romantic languages, romantic languages, sorry? I think there's a, there's a kind of a claim that, that it is. Uh, and certainly there is something in that, is that you'll find that the, um, the Latin words reappear in, in the other uh, Romance languages. And that, that's certainly true. And also in English, actually, and probably Latin is actually more helpful for the English. It's sort of like the, yeah, a lot of Latin words, uh, you have, have, have um, a lot of English words have the roots in Latin. So, and it helps you to increase your own vocabulary in, in, in that. Um, I think probably more helpful actually was, you know, learning one Romance language that helps you with, with the others. Because the, the Romance languages, as they developed from Latin, have changed a little bit. And they've changed in different ways. French is probably the most. Or maybe Romanian is a little bit kind of different from the others, but the whole group of them, Italian, Spanish, and Portuguese and Catalan, they're all kind of fairly, fairly similar, and you can you can pick up one, one, one from the other. But Latin itself is just a fascinating language. It's a this strange structure it has. And you've got this kind of feeling that you're you're communicating with these people from way, way back. Uh, and occasionally, you know, you see you see Latin, you see a Latin inscription, say, well, I can read that or I can translate that. That's, that's kind of satisfying. Um, so I've got no regrets about learning Latin. At some point, I'd like to go back and uh, pick it up, uh, pick it up again. Okay, and another question is, if you were to give a year 11 or year 12 student only one key strategy slash resource to develop their language proficiency, what would you suggest? Uh, listen to your teacher. <laughs> the, uh, there's a tremendous, you know, I, I think, I think if, you're, if you're young, and I, don't, I didn't appreciate that when I was at school, actually. Uh, we had teachers in front of us who were really wanting us to learn a language, you know, 
and it's much easier when you've got a teacher in front of you than trying to learn it on your own. And that's definitely true. You know, you've got a, a, a real motivation, you know, she's helping you on, they'll be able to correct your mistakes. If you're trying to learn anything on your own, then it's a little bit more difficult. Um, you know, you don't get that kind of feedback. So uh, basically, you know, use your teachers, use that opportunity. But if you're interested beyond that, I, I do think, uh, I think a lot of people really like these apps, you know, things like Memrise and, and Duolingo, because they're very simple. Uh, they can, you can pick up a lot of vocabulary really quickly, which you can then use back in the classroom and your teacher will be really impressed with that. And they're pretty good quality, uh, pretty good quality uh, apps. So listen to your teacher and then have a look at maybe some of the online stuff. That would be my kind of uh, advice at, at the moment. Uh, the teachers are your best resource. I mean, even like uh, as as a, as I found when I was uh, kind of learn, I kind of done a lot of language learning on my, my own. I've done I've done all sorts of classes and stuff like that. I don't mind learning on, on my own. People don't. Uh, some people don't like that uh, so much. It's very hard to motivate yourself, for example. But certainly, if you go into a class, it makes an awful lot of difference. There's a social aspect of language. You know, you're speaking. The whole point of it is to speak to other people, and it's really nice. Even speaking to other learners is quite quite a nice thing to do. Uh, and and certainly, you know, having a teacher in front of you who is listening to what you're saying and saying, "Clive, now that's that's not you can you can do better than that." That is a very good motivation, I, I think. Uh, uh, so so it's a social it's a social thing. Uh, I've, I've made a lot of good friends actually just learning languages. You know, so I've been just in the classes. It's just good fun. Where you think <laughs> you've known a language well enough, how mm. do you remain fluent or almost remain at that level? That's a great question. It's really quite difficult, actually. Um, if you, it's easier to stay fluent in, 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 in sort of one language or two languages. That, that's certainly true. Um, I, I think the sort of thing that uh, I would do is, is do, uh, as, as I mentioned, is, is watch stuff on the telly, you know. Um, you can, uh, you know, uh, my, my, my Spanish goes up and down. When I'm in Spain, it goes up, and when I come away, it goes down again. Uh, I kind of forget uh, stuff. Um, but, you know, watching, uh, watching a bit of telly, watching Casa de Papel, Money Heist, as it is in England, that's really great. Let's, uh, you can obviously watch it. Uh, you watch the dubbed version, but that's cheating. Uh, if you watch the Spanish version, even the subtitles, you can pick up, oh, that's an interesting word. I haven't heard that before. So that, that's quite good. And I, as I say, just watching that stuff, you can pick up a little bit of tone. Uh, the way that you know Spanish people speak to each other and, and the sort of expressions they use, you can pick up a lot of stuff. Sometimes it's um, you know it's not learning in the sort of sense you're certainly learning vocabulary, but you you just pick up a a lot of stuff. And of course, um, you can actually I tell you the other thing you can do is um, I sort of just watch. Um, television and, and other, other, other languages um, the nice thing about the kind of wonderful internet is I can watch Portuguese or, or Catalan TV streaming just straight into the um, uh, straight into the home and you can do that and if you are if you are clever you can get Spanish and uh, <coughs> Spanish and French TV also in, into that and that's quite interesting again I don't do that a lot but it's just quite nice to just listen again can remind you there's a language out there people are speaking it and uh, and that's uh, that's quite fun. But the, the main thing is obviously if you can get into get uh, go to that country and speak to lo locals, that that's uh, that's the nicest way. And it's a, that's a really a really great feedback. You get it's very satisfying when you do that. Uh, and your language, you know, I guess it gets a bit rusty, but you can pick it up again quite quite quickly. It's hugely satisfying if you can do that. Are there any shows or sorry shows or films that you would recommend watching? for whether that's Spanish, Castellan or, yeah. um, or French. Yeah, so if you watch, I mean, when you're watching um, <clears throat> the TV shows or, or, or a film or something like that, you know, it's, it's obviously, it's very natural language, you know, they speak quite quickly and even if you've got subtitles on, you can mm, don't quite get all that. Um, if you're kind of like um, more kind of beginner, so, so if you're at more beginner level, uh, go and have a look at some of the stuff on, on, on YouTube. There's some really good stuff where people uh, have material just for learners, you know, and it's sort of mostly around beginners, learners, or maybe intermediate stuff, and they kind of slow things down a little bit and use slightly simpler vocabulary. And that's a good stepping stone into the sort of watching, you know, kind of live uh, French or, you know, Italian TV. Um, I tell you, I tell you actually one thing I quite like the watch is uh, is the because uh, you can get you can get these things quite easily, uh, you know, uh, on, 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 online. It's watching things like shopping channels. Uh, <laughs> shopping channels are really interesting because they uh, go shopping channels. You know, it's like people show things and say buy these shoes or these trousers or this uh, mixer or whatever. Uh, but the language they use is quite simple because they say, "Isn't this a lovely pair of trousers?" and "Look how look nice it looks," and so on. And it's really quite good language. It's quite good stuff. Um, it's quite simple. Uh, you can see something in front of you and you can know what they're talking about and they they often treat the audience like they're a bit stupid so it's quite a nice uh, nice easy form of language 
I, I, I've watched a lot of shopping channels and things like German and stuff like that. It's quite nice to be able to do that. Amari, you're on mute. Sorry. Yeah, my bad. <laughs> Um, I said that Adam wants to know if you ever find yourself getting confused with all of the all of the different languages. Do you know that is a really that is a really interesting question. Um, and um, do you get confused? So occasionally, um, I think there's a probably at some point where you're at some kind of intermediate level they can get mixed up a little bit. Um, but actually, I found that it's not as bad as you think. I mean, I don't tend to get Spanish and um and, and, and french for example it makes up maybe spanish and italian occasionally but the the whole tone of the languages is a little bit different so it's uh you, you, you tend not to i mean what's interesting is i remember my, my my italian teacher saying to me clive you says you, you speak italian like a spanish person person speaking in italian and i thought that was quite actually quite i thought that was quite a compliment actually and similar to uh, portuguese and my portuguese teacher said well, you, spend, you sound like a Spanish person speaking Portuguese. So you, you can you can bring that from you know one language into the other. I don't think that's a terrible thing, actually. Occasionally, bits of vocabulary you kind of drop off and you can't quite remember. You can remember it in French, but not in in Spanish. That sort of thing happens sometimes. But um, but if you're if you're if you're actually speaking with people face to face, often you, you kind of get your head goes into that kind of language and you uh, you, you, you keep it uh, keep it going without getting too lost. Um, but, uh, certainly for I, I really admire these people who can, can keep a lot of different languages up to up to a fairly fairly good level. I don't fully believe it myself. You know, I just don't think you can do it. I don't think I don't think people's heads are big enough to keep uh, twenty different languages all going together. I mean, I think we've gone along from the days that you can't speak two languages and makes your head explode. That that we've moved along from that quite a long way. But I still think you know trying to speak twenty languages. I think at a decent level, people seem to be able to do it, but. Yeah, I don't think I could do that. I'm quite happy with my little, little handful of languages. Uh, this question says, how many minutes a day should you practice or would you recommend for someone learning a language from scratch? Well, um, if you go back on to the, um, um, uh, I remember I had those little columns with A1, B2, all that sort of thing. Um, it tends, they often have how many hours um, to, to get to a certain level, right? So to get to A1, which is quite basic, but quite usable language, uh, 100 hours, for example. So you kind of have to work out yourself, well, how, how am I going to do that? I mean, if I'm going on holiday um, next week, then I probably have to spend a bit of time if I want to get 100 hours done. Uh, but if it's sometime in the future, next summer, well, I can maybe just do, you know, um, a couple of hours a week, you know, and that I'll get to that level. And and actually, language learning, and I think this is something that's, that, that, that I think that's been shown scientifically, really, is that it's better to do a little bit often rather than try to do a lot at one time. So you're better doing 15 minutes a day than, you know, three hours in, 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 on, 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 a, on a, you know, a Sunday morning. It really is like that. Uh, it keeps, keeps the thing going, seems to be a lot better. And, and also, um, there's been a lot of work done on what you might call intermittent learning as you learn something. You know what they see people say, is you have to learn it and then forget it twice before you really learn it. I'm not quite sure about that, but there is something in that. If you kind of keep doing it sort of steadily over a period of time, uh, you do seem to learn it a little bit better, a little bit deeper uh, than if you cram something in. So that'd be my recommendation is to do that. Uh, so I would say, you know, about half an hour in a, in a day, it depends how much time you've got. If you can do something like using the, the earphone things we're saying on the bus, man, we've got hours in the day to do that. I used to, I learned um, Dutch. Um, just commuting into work, yeah. So earphones in. It's an hour's commute. I used to go there, half an hour there, half an hour back. That's an hour of study a day. And I wasn't speaking to anybody else in the tube anyway. So it was, uh, you know, so otherwise it was kind of dead time. It's quite good to, to, to uh, good good use of, of time. But certainly little and often really is 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 the, the the trick. But the more time you spend on it, the further you're going to go. I think that's why these um, little apps, you know, Memrise and Duolingo are quite popular because they kind of like, do you know, they they're on their phone. You're on their phone. You're on. They're on your phone. And they kind of prompt you, you know, they said, Clive, you haven't done anything for a day. Why don't you come and do some vocabulary? And I'll give you a little a little tick or a little star or a dancing owl or something like that to, to encourage you. And I think that's good. And I think, you know, and the kind of, you know, as I say, some bits of learning language can be tedious. And if that makes it more interesting, it, it does help a lot. And I think they, they will encourage you. If you look at kind of, as I say, Memrise or 
Duolingo, they, they really encourage you to do a little bit every day. And uh, you have what's called streaks. So you do like five days of language and they'll give you a star and a little tune comes up or something like that. Um, um, and and they'll they'll sort of be quite quite angry with you. And they, they won't, but you know they'll be angry if you do, if you don't do anything for a for a week. You know they'll, they'll be quite stern. So um, so I, I think uh, I say little and often and I can use if these things will help you. You use them. You said you struggled uh, learning Romanian. <laughs> I was wondering what your barriers were. <laughs> that was so different to, let's say, um, other European languages. Yeah, so Romanian is a Romanian is a Latin language. Um, that's the first thing. So if you, uh, it's actually quite like it's quite it's quite a Latin language, and uh, you can recognise quite a lot of words in there. Um, the uh, and the thing for me, I think the problem with it is uh, I'm a bit of a lazy language learner. Yeah, okay, is that I will go, I always go for the least path of least resistance. So that's why I started in Italian after Spanish. So, so Romanian is a bit uh, different because, as I say, it's a bit more like Latin in the sense that, you know, each word has a number of different forms, depending where you use it in the sentence. Uh, the plurals are a little bit different. It's, they don't have like a nice S at the end like Spanish or an I at the end like they have in Italian. They have all these different things. You have to learn each plural you know, one one bus, two buses. It's not quite like that yet, Lena. So, so there's quite a lot of grammar. It's also a little bit Slavic. Uh, Romanian is uh, we got somehow and historically it kind of like got split off from the other Latin languages, and it's sitting in a, a little island of Latinness amongst all of the Slavic languages. So it has a, some sort of kind of little odds and odd kind of Slavic kind of things there. So when you approach it. <clears throat> it's not like learning Italian. It's a little bit more difficult. You have to sort of spend a bit more time in it. Um, and I think at that time, I'd, I'd, I'd been over to, I did a project with some people in Romania. I went to Timisoara and I learned a little bit of Romanian, but I realised it was going to be quite a lot of effort to go a little any further uh, from that. But again, it's much easier to learn Romanian than it would be to learn, let's say, Russian or Polish or something like that, for which, um, you know, I've got no, it'd be completely new for me. Romanian would be, be much easier. And um, a lot of Romanian people in, in, in London, and uh, it'd be, I, I've, I, I quite fancy having another go at it. And of course, it's a really interesting country. You can get into a country which is, it is uh, it's a Balkan country. It's quite, uh, or near the Balkans, it's, it's quite a different kind of culture and so on. But if you learn a language, you can get access to that uh, in quite an interesting way. So uh, it's still my target to have a go with uh, uh, a bit more with Romanian. Um, I've just been aware we haven't got a long left, but this sort of links to the question from before. Um, the question says, uh, if you've learned Latin, which of the languages would be easier to learn? Um, so Italian, but you suggested Romanian, and there's also Spanish. So in terms of what's closest, uh, I would say, <clears throat> that's interesting, um, I did have a slide somewhere to say that, they're all pretty much grouped together. Um, I, I actually think Spanish is probably the closest, to be honest. Uh, Italian, likewise. There's an interesting video if you kind of um, uh, if you're interested in these sorts of things. There's this guy on the, on 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 the YouTube on the YouTube who speaks Latin. He speaks fluent Latin. You know, it's sort of really kind of impressive. And there's a nice little YouTuber. He goes around uh, Rome speaking to people in Latin, asking them various questions. And of course, the, the poor old Romans they went, oh, I don't know, you know, non comprendo, I know that sort of stuff. Um, so Latin is actually. Not as quite as close to Latin. Uh, sorry, Italian is not as quite as close to Latin as you'd think, uh, because uh, they start, uh, Italian came from what was called vulgar Latin. It wasn't vulgar in the fact that they were swearing; it was just that I was speaking by the the popular people uh, in Italy, and uh, and that that was quite a bit different from classical Latin. But in Spain, um, they they use a sort of bit more traditional Latin, <laughs> strangely enough, over there. So Spanish is, is a bit uh, uh, closer. French is a little bit different. Uh, that had a big influence from Gaulish which was a sort of a Germanic language from way, way back. So that's why French is a little bit different. Portuguese is, uh, as I say, similar to uh, Spanish. So I find Portuguese a little bit more difficult to, um, to uh, understand um, um, a little bit. Uh, Spanish and uh, Italian are the easiest ones. So I would go for, I would go for Spanish or Italian. Uh, Spanish is, is a more global language, has to be said. Um, uh, I was in New York some years ago and you heard Spanish around you all the time. Uh, people were uh, speaking Spanish. Now, certainly if you go down to places like Florida and the south, southern parts of the US, they speak a lot of Spanish. It's quite nice to know uh, a little bit of Spanish for, for that. So I would say I would say Spanish, is, as I said, from my experience, is a really good gateway language. You know, start off with one and then you think, well, I'm Spanish and well, Italian, I get that for free. Or, you know, Portuguese, I can have it. I mean, it's not quite true, but you know what I mean? It's something that you can you can make. An, it's an easier step than to go to Italian or to uh, 
uh, or to Portuguese. But on the other hand, if you're, you know, if you've got an Italian family and you've got people who want to speak to Italian, you know, learn Italian. And then you can step over into Spanish if you feel the, feel the need uh, at some point, you know. So, um, 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 you know, either, either way it kind of works, I think. What kind of jobs were available for polyglot? For polyglot, um, <laughs> so um, the it's, it's quite interesting. The, the the I mean, obviously, like in in um, people uh, out in the world want to learn English. You know um, that um, if you, for example, um, um, people want to do business with the UK or the US, they they want to learn English. But everybody says to me. As I say, that if you can learn, if you can speak the local language, you'd get on a lot better with them. Um, for example, I know people who um, who work in China, and uh, they have uh, they most people they work with are English speaking. But if they want to kind of do business, they've learned Chinese and they do learn. It's a hard language to learn, but tremendously rewarding because you get uh, access to a different people speak in a different kind of way. Um, you know, if I speak uh, English with a Spanish person, I speak in a certain kind of way. There's always kind of a language barrier. If you're out there and you're speaking Spanish to a Spanish person, they will speak to you in, in a different kind of way. And you get a different kind of, uh, um, um, a different kind of re relation with them. So if you're kind of like in business, for example, if you're interested in that, if you're interested in business or work that is uh, uh, in, um, uh, uh, in, in, in other countries, then it is really, really worthwhile doing that. There's obviously things like uh, teaching. Uh, to say, if you're really interested in languages, teaching languages is, is a lovely thing to do. You can teach English, obviously, but other languages uh, as well, translating. Um, and, uh, and as I say, a lot of uh, companies uh, are really interested in having uh, language uh, people with languages and, and working for them. Languages are actually interesting. Often it's not just the language speaking. It's a bit like if you made the effort to learn a language and you've got a, you know, an A-level A level in language or even GC, GCSE, they, people think you're kind of kind of cool. Yeah? It makes you sort of sound clever if you, <laughs> if you speak a language. It may not be true, but it makes you sound clever. And you say, oh, yes, I can speak. I've got A-level Italian. And that sounds really good. So it's, it's, it's a kind of little badge that you've, you've made an effort. Uh, you've done something which is not that easy but you can you can manage it and you've achieved it so um you know i would recommend uh, honestly i would recommend you doing uh, carry on with your language uh, studies anything else how are we doing for time oh nearly there yeah um i was going to ask um about when learning other languages do you take mm. a lot of notice about different dialects or different accents and regions of the country yeah that, that's a, that's a kind of a really kind of interesting one you, the um when you learn a language uh, generally speaking you learn a, what, what we might call a standard form so um you, you learn a kind of standard form of uh, let's say italian for example but when you actually go to italy People speak an awful lot of different dialects, and some of the different some of the different dialects are actually different languages. Sardinian, for example, uh, Sardo as it's called, uh, just spoken in Sardinia, um, that's now recognised like Scots is as a different language. Um, once be, once thought of a, as a dialect, but um, um, I, I certainly I remember going on the train. Uh, I was in near Naples, yes, uh, Naples, and they uh, just listened to people speaking around, and they're speaking a dialect called uh, uh, Napoli. Was it Neapolitan? Neapolitan, that would be it. Naples, yeah. And could I understand it? No, really. I have to say, it's a bit like uh, uh, somebody coming into Scotland and hearing people speaking Scots. They're like, I don't really can understand what they're talking about. Um, but th what you've done is you've learned the standard for format. So they, they they could understand. If you spoke to them in standard Italian, they would be able to understand. And they would speak back to you in standard Italian. Same as a Scottish person, even if they're sort of like a real aficionado of Scots. Well, obviously we can speak English and we will speak to you back in English as well. Uh, but some languages, you know, uh, Irish is an interesting language, is that, uh, um, and Deb speaks Irish, and they've got a number of different dialects. So when you learn that, you have to really learn one of the dialects. Is that not true, Deb? Yes? Yes, you're nodding there. It's not, uh, it doesn't have a, it doesn't really have a standard form. It's kind of really weird that way. So you have to learn sort of the language of, um, uh, of Northern Ireland, uh, Ulster, or over the West or down the South. Um, and some of the languages are a bit like that. Uh, Finnish has got very, a lot of different dialects in there uh, and, and so on. So, um, but it, you start, if you like, you start with a standard one. And that's, that's the way you can communicate with them. But once you get into it, you know, it's kind of interesting. Uh, Portuguese, another one where you've got two different, quite different dialects. Uh, the Portu Port Portuguese of Portugal and the Portuguese of um, 
uh, or Brazil and Portuguese of Angola, all slightly different. Um, and that's actually quite a bit different, those two different ones. So again, in, well, Portuguese is a good example. You probably then pick one or the other. You say, well, I'm going to learn um, um, European Portuguese or I'm going to learn Brazilian Portuguese, and that's the dialect I'm going to uh, stick with. You can understand the other one. But I think for a European person, personally, I think learning European Portuguese is probably more natural. Um, but uh, maybe not, you have a different opinion. Um, having, oh, this question there, having spoken English and Scottish languages, that helped learn other languages. I think it makes you very aware of languages, folks. If you have, uh, haven't spoken to two different languages when I was young, it makes you very aware that of, of the way that people speak around about you. And I think that's, that's quite a good thing. I was, uh, I was I mentioning one of the slides about social language and social linguistics and all that sort of thing. If you kind of get into that, it's really fascinating the way that people, uh, speak to each other and you know even down in London you know different dialects that people use different words uh, Deb uh, wife obviously being a teacher she brings back words that are used by the, the kids in the classroom I think oh wow that's really interesting I've never heard that word before so it makes you a bit more aware of, of language and that does help you when you're going off learning another language you, so you, you get kind of aware of different words and different ways they're used um, it's quite a nice thing. It's just, it's just it makes everyday conversation so much more interesting when you have that sort of um, awareness of um, the way that people speak to each other. Um, do you believe that language is a political construct? A political construct? Yes, yes, it is. Um, when I was saying that um, when you learn a language, you learn a kind of a, um, a standard language. That standard is often constructed. Yeah. So uh, what that means is somebody has written a dictionary and they've got a grammar and this and that. So Italian is a kind of good example, as any. Um, there's a standard Italian. Now, how many people really speak at standard Italian? Originally, not many. Uh, they do now. Uh, but Italian was uh, constructed, if you like, to try and bring the Italian, all these various dialects and, and people together. Italian, Italy was a country which was built um, from a number of different uh, parts, if you like. Uh, so Italian then becomes to link that together. German is exa exactly the same, same sort of thing. It's a language which uh, people often in Germany, they speak sort of various dialects. And then they've got what's called High German, which actually its very name says uh, uh, something about it. And that's the sort of overarching classical German that you would learn. Uh, at, at school, uh, even though, as I say, people would speak their own dialect. So there's a political thing uh, in there as well. And Scots is a kind of bit of a political hot potato as well. So we will, that's for another conversation, I think. All right, thank you, Dr. Young. Um, and thank you to everyone for coming today. Uh, next week, there will be another Thinking About lecture about blood legacy. So that's all the questions and thank you for answering. Thank you. Thank you for all these really interesting questions. It's, it's, it's been really delight to, to speak with you this evening.